Well, merci, John. Merci, tout le monde, euh, pour votre bon nom. Euh, je suis très heureux d'être ici à Montréal, euh, parmi mes amis. Euh, et euh, un gros merci à tout le monde euh, d'être venu. Aujourd'hui, euh, j'aimerais vous parler de la gestion des risques. Nous sommes tous appelés à gérer des risques, et ce, dans tous les aspects de notre vie, ce soit comme chef d'entreprise, par exemple, dans le cadre de notre carrière, ou en prenant soin de notre famille. Quand nous préparons des plans en vue d'atteindre un but, nous tenons compte des problèmes potentiels et de ce que nous pouvons faire pour les atténuer. Évidemment, on ne pourra jamais éliminer complètement les risques. On ne peut que les gérer prudemment. Mais comme économiste et dirigeant de Banque centrale, je réfléchis beaucoup aux risques. Et je ne suis pas seul. En réaction à ce que nous avons vécu ces dernières années, les banquiers centraux, partout dans le monde, adaptent leur façon de faire. À la Banque du Canada, conscient de l'incertitude accrue, nous ajustons notre façon de voir les risques, notre manière de les évaluer, et le rôle qu'ils jouent dans les décisions de politique monétaire. Voilà le sujet dont je vais traiter cet après-midi. Soulignons d'abord que certaines choses n'ont pas changé. Bien au contraire. Le meilleur moyen pour la Banque du Canada de remplir son mandat est, comme toujours, de maintenir l'inflation à un niveau bas, stable et prévisible. En 1991, la banque a adopté une cible d'inflation et depuis 1995, nous visons un taux d'inflation de 2 Et cette cible est sacrée. En anglais, c'est sacrosanct. Et en plus de deux décennies d'inflation targeting, nous avons généralement succédé. En average, l'inflation a été très close à notre target. Now, this has not happened by itself. Like navigating a ship, we've had to adjust to the currents around us and to bouts of foul weather from time to time. And some of those challenges were minor, calling for temporary adjustments in course or speed, but others may involve a major detour. In worst case scenarios, there are risks of running aground or even capsizing. In all cases, we have to anticipate as well as react. Now, the bank's governing council sets the policy interest rate with the goal of achieving our 2% inflation target. And central to this decision is our view of the most likely path for the Canadian and the global economies. Conditional on these forecasts, there is a unique path for interest rates that should bring us back to target, just like the captain who plots the intended course for his ship. Now, at that point in the monetary policy process, policy can really seem like precision engineering. But like at sea, in monetary policy, the view is not always just so clear. And given what we've been through and what we continue to experience, our forecasts are not pinpoint numbers. Rather, they represent ranges of likely outcomes. Likewise, our economic models are a better source of questions today than they are answers. To make sure that such uncertainty is not just acknowledged, but is actually embedded in our policy decisions, we've incorporated explicit rule of thumb ranges around the most critical variables in our projections. In doing so, we're reminding ourselves, and of course those who watch us, that especially in the wake of the crisis, economic projections are subject to considerable uncertainty. Indeed, While Canada came through the global financial crisis and the ensuing Great Recession better than our G7 peers, we're taking longer than expected or desired to get home. Our economy still has not returned to full capacity, and inflation has been running persistently 
below our 2% target. Now, because of the unprecedented nature of the crisis and the subsequent recession, the global recovery has been anything but smooth or normal. And as we navigate these uncharted waters, we're especially vigilant in our lookout for risks that could push us further off course. Now, this lookout is an important element of our policy deliberations. We assess how risks could interact with each other. We gauge their potential impact. We use judgment to determine the balance among them, both today and, importantly, in prospect. In fact, monetary policy formulation these days is more a process of risk management than one of precision engineering. Now, it's important to stress that risks are not part of the baseline forecast. They are not what the bank expects to see. Rather, they are the possible deviations from what we're anticipating. And we work to avoid, or at least to mitigate them. Now, the Banque du Canada envisage les risques à travers deux prismes. Premièrement, le fait possible sur les perspectives d'évolution de l'activité économique réelle et de l'inflation. Et deuxièmement, le fait possible sur la stabilité du système financier. Ces deux groupes de risques sont liés entre eux. Mais pour le moment, je vais les aborder séparément. Le ciblage de l'inflation est nécessairement une démarche perspective. Il repose sur le travail des prévisionnistes économiques qui passent des données à la moulinette et utilisent des modèles pour évaluer la trajectoire future la plus probable de l'inflation. Comme notre cible est symétrique, nous sommes autant préoccupés par les risques à la hausse qui touchent l'inflation que par les risques à la baisse. Bien entendu, quand l'inflation est déjà sous la cible, comme c'est le cas aujourd'hui, nous nous préoccupons davantage des risques à la baisse que des risques à la hausse. La projection de la banque concernant l'inflation et son évaluation des risques entourant cette projection sont publiées tous les trimestres dans le rapport sur la politique monétaire. Les risques qui planent sur la stabilité financière sont examinés à travers un prisme différent. Ces risques sont ceux qui pourraient perturber le système financier ou lui nuire, c'est-à-dire les risques à la baisse, négatifs. Notre objectif premier est de déterminer la probabilité qu'ils se matérialisent. Et si c'était le cas, leur effet sur les institutions financières et le fonctionnement des marchés. La banque analyse ces risques en profondeur deux fois par année dans la revue du système financier. On vient de publier la plus récente livraison il y a à peine deux jours. Nous abordons les deux groupes de risques sous, sous des angles différents et nous prenons en considération les interactions entre eux. <clears throat> now, we learned through the painful experience of the recent crisis that pursuing economic stability without due regard for financial stability risks achieving neither. Both are necessary, but neither one is sufficient. Both are central complements to one another, not substitutes. It follows naturally that as policymakers, we consider the risks to economic stability and financial stability in an integrated fashion. If you like, like two lenses of binoculars, this adds depth to our understanding of the forces at play. So let me use a couple of examples. People ask me pretty well every day about the potential in our present situation of runaway inflation or runaway deflation. Indeed, sometimes the same person is worried about both. Now, these risks sit at the extremes of the distribution of what's possible. So let me address each of them in turn. Let's talk first about the risk of runaway inflation. This happened 40 years ago here in Canada and in most advanced economies. Prices spiraled up, economic growth was weak, unemployment was rising, 
and inflation got away from us. People's expectations of future inflation became unanchored, pushing up actual inflation further. Interest rates were also very high, but savings were eroded by the high inflation rate. When the Bank of Canada finally made a determined effort to bring inflation back under control, our economy went through a major recession. Now, some wonder if today's easy monetary policy here in Canada, and alongside quantitative easing in some other countries, could lead to a similar outcome. Their fear is that all that money creation is eventually going to result in an explosion in inflation. Well, they didn't worry. The situation now is very different from the early 1970s. Monetary stimulus today is offsetting the serious and still ongoing downside shocks resulting from the crisis. Of course, it is still worth asking what will happen when those negative forces abate. Could all that additional liquidity fuel inflation then? And my answer is this. Central banks will need to drain that extra liquidity from the system at some point as the economy heals. And while I don't want to underestimate the challenge of getting that exit exactly right, I'm confident that we have the ability to keep inflation from taking off. And in short, we will remain vigilant. We're prepared to remove monetary stimulus when it's no longer needed to offset the forces that currently are pulling inflation below target. But right now, it looks to us like it will take around two years to get inflation back up to 2%. Passons maintenant au risque d'une déflation, proprement dite. Tout comme l'inflation qui devient galopante, la déflation peut devenir une spirale, mais à la baisse. Les attentes perdent leur point d'ancrage inférieur. Les gens retardent leurs achats, car ils s'attendent à ce que les prix baissent dans l'avenir. La demande recule en même temps que les prix, et le fardeau de la dette sur l'économie s'alourdit. Pendant la Grande Dépression, par exemple, les prix à la consommation au Canada ont chuté de 25 La production nationale a été réduite de près du tiers. Avec un taux de chômage de 20 le coût humain était colossal. Le Japon a été reprise avec une forme bénigne de trappe déflationniste au cours des 20 dernières années. Ce que je décris est un processus de déflation touchant l'ensemble de l'économie. C'est très différent d'une situation où des prix dans une économie encore en plein essor. Aujourd'hui, ce qui inquiète, c'est que même si on a réussi à éviter une déflation à l'échelle mondiale dans la foulée de la crise, il existe encore un risque que l'inflation ne bascule en territoire déflationniste. La raison en est que le contre-camp de la crise se font encore sentir. C'est de moins en partie pour contrer ce risque que les banques centrales ont cherché à donner une impulsion additionnelle à leur économie. Ainsi, elles ont maintenu les taux d'intérêt très bas et mise en œuvre des politiques monétaires non traditionnelles, comme l'assouplissement quantitatif. L'histoire nous montre que la déflation survit habituellement à la suite d'une crise financière. C'était le cas pour la Grande Dépression, de même qu'au Japon pendant la décennie 90. La leçon la plus importante tirée de la crise est donc peut-être que la stabilité du système financier est cruciale pour maintenir l'inflation à un niveau bas, stable et prévisible, et pour limiter le risque de tomber dans une trappe déflationniste. And that's why the G20 leaders launched a reform agenda in 2009 to make the global financial system more robust. In short, we never want to go through this again. Since the crisis, central banks have also been focusing greater attention on financial stability issues. In fact, this is a return to our roots. Many central banks were created primarily to preserve financial stability. This includes the Bank of Canada, which came into being during the Great Depression. 
<clears throat> the first line of defense against a buildup of financial imbalances is effective regulation and supervision. And in Canada, it's ultimately the Minister of Finance who is responsible for the stewardship of the financial system. Regulation is carried out by OSFI, deposit insurance by CDIC, and consumer awareness by FCAC. The Bank of Canada's assessment of financial stability risk is an important contribution to this team effort. It's also critical, as I mentioned earlier, to the bank's policymaking. Today, we are focused in particular on the risk associated with household imbalances. And to explain, let me just back up a little. At the height of the crisis, although our financial system remained sound, our exports collapsed, causing a recession. To support economic growth, we've relied mainly on household spending, supported by exceptionally stimulative monetary policy. But there are trade-offs, lots of them. Today, the most obvious is that prolonged low interest rates can result in the development of imbalances in the household sector. So in Canada, we have seen rising levels of indebtedness, stretched house price valuations, and of course, overinvestment in housing. And to address these imbalances, the Minister of Finance tightened mortgage insurance rules four times, among other measures, and the Superintendent of Financial Institutions introduced stronger mortgage underwriting standards for Canada's banking institutions. And in the wake of these measures, a constructive evolution of household imbalances began around the middle of last year. Growth in household borrowing has moderated, and residential investment is on a more sustainable track. Now, those indicators have picked up again recently, and we think mainly because people pulled forward their plans when mortgage rates started to move up during the summer. So we expect these imbalances to stabilize and then to gradually unwind in coming years. In our base case scenario, the bank expects a soft landing in housing and a pickup in exports and investment. And this rotation will relieve the tension between low demand and household imbalances. Nonetheless, the risks around this base case need to be managed. There is a risk that household imbalances could keep building and set the stage for a sharp correction down the road. Such a correction would be a risk both to the Canadian economy and to our financial system. Our current monetary policy weighs this risk against the risk of inflation falling even further below our target. This zone of balance is relevant today and in prospect, as we expect both of those risks to diminish over the next two years or so. And this is what I mean when I describe monetary policy today as an exercise in risk management. Our flexible inflation targeting framework gives us this room to maneuver in the face of unusual shocks. This only works, of course, if expectations are well anchored. The public must be confident that we will get to the 2% target. So our commitment to the inflation target must remain credible. Credibility is coin. It's earned only through years of sound policy. Without it, low and stable inflation could only be achieved at considerable short-run cost to the economy, as was our experience in the early 1980s when we tackled runaway inflation. So credibility must be employed very wisely. We think of it as an investment. By using credibility to exercise the framework's flexibility, we are working to maintain stable financial conditions. And this will support the expansion of capacity and the return of the economy to its full potential. And as the process unfolds, we anticipate that there will be a future payoff of enhanced credibility. Dans nos décisions de politique, nous ne pouvons pas tenir la crédibilité pour acquise. Nous devons continuer à le gagner en veillant, d'abord et avant tout, à ce que la politique monétaire demeure axée sur le maintien de l'inflation à la cible. Permettez-moi de conclure. J'ai décrit comment nous gérons toute une série de risques liés à nos décisions de politique. Nous évaluons le risque à travers deux prismes. Nous nous intéressons à deux grands risques 
l'inflation galopante et la déflation, et nous intervenons pour les réduire au minimum. Nous avons appris à la dure que la stabilité financière est une condition nécessaire à une inflation basse et stable. Et nous nous employons ici au Canada et à l'échelle du globe à améliorer la résilience du système financier. Au moment de formuler la politique monétaire suivie actuellement, nous mettons en balance le risque que l'inflation ne baisse encore davantage sur la cible et les risques d'aggravation des déséquilibres au sein du système financier. As central bankers here in Canada and globally, we are in new territory. It brings to mind the sailors of another era who were driven far off course by a nasty storm. And when things calmed, they found themselves in the southern hemisphere. And suddenly the navigational chart that they relied on, the night sky, was completely different. We have every reason to believe that after the experience of the crisis is behind us, central banking will be defined very differently than it was just five years ago. We know that economic and financial stability are intrinsically linked, and we are figuring out as we go how to better integrate the two in our analysis and research and in our policy. On a technical level, we are actively building new models and adding new detail to our existing ones. We're spending more time talking to real people, making real economic decisions to understand better the forces that we are facing. And we are communicating differently, not just more, but with more transparency, with due regard to the uncertainty around us. Now, I'm confident that we've got it roughly right, given what we know, and especially what we don't know. Just like those sailors on the open seas, we will adapt and thrive, and we'll find our way home. Je vous remercie beaucoup. C'est la période des questions. C'est ouais. des questions pour euh, M. Polos. Euh, le <coughs> micro est ici et ouais. là-bas. Ouais. Ah, question extérieure. Ouais. Yeah. Uh, does the bank, does the bank uh, think the Canadian dollar is roughly fairly valued at current levels versus the U.S. dollar? Thank you. <laughs> Next question. No, seriously, next question. <clears throat> oh. All right, then. No, uh, actually, the, the, the answer to that question is that the Canadian dollar is uh, determined in markets. We're focused on inflation, as uh, just made really clear. The Canadian dollar will be whatever it's going to be as markets grind that out. And so the simple answer to your question is it's always the right value, because the market always gets it right. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Polas, uh, I was going to ask you a question on Canada, but I fear you're going to sacrosanct at me. So I will call on your international expertise instead. Uh, it remains a mystery for me, and you're talking about deflation being a potential threat to global financial markets. If you look at our trading partners, you look at the Japanese experience right now, a uh, uh, deflationary trap that you were mentioning. Uh, Japan first encountered negative working age population in 1998, and after that it was very difficult for the central bank to bring inflation back in the system. Mm -hmm. In 2013, it actually hit another of our trading partners, the Eurozone. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mr. Dragic was asked whether or not he believed that the Eurozone faces a deflationary trap. I'm just curious of what, what you see about our trading partners and the potential for uh, deflation, maybe not in Canada, but to become more widespread in our tra trading partners. Well, um, first of all, we all experience a crisis. We're all dealing with the aftermath. As I've characterized it before, you had a, we had a global bubble, and after a bubble, you always get a crater. So we're all in the crater, and we're working our way through it. 
Um, that means that uh, it shouldn't be that surprising. We have not gotten out of the crater yet, and therefore there's still this downward pull on global inflation almost everywhere because there is excess capacity, not just here or in the U.S., but pretty well everywhere. Um, so the reason we pick a 2% target is to give us a 2 percentage point room to maneuver. When there are big shocks and you get a chance to react to that, interest rates remain above zero and you can adjust to the shock. And that's why we get concerned that if inflation gets even lower, that we have less room to maneuver for whatever the next big shock might be. So I would, I would assert that every central bank ultimately has the ability to choose its inflation rate, that Japan didn't do everything that it could have done over the last 20 years to actually fix the financial system and get out, and they are now doing most of those things. So that's an experiment which remains to be played out. But inflation is not determined by what your population growth or your labor market growth is. It's determined by your monetary policy everywhere always and everywhere. Um, so ultimately, that risk remains with us. It's a global risk. We share in that risk. And we're all working very hard to make, uh, to fill in that crater with new growth and foster the conditions to a return to what I call natural growth. And as that happens over the next year or two, we expect about two years, it'll take us to get inflation back up to our target of about 2%. In Japan, who knows? They might get there before we do, because they're using very aggressive measures. Thank you. Hope that answers your question, because I'm <laughs> done with it. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, here we are. Hopefully, this will be an easy one. Uh, okay, where are you? I can't I'm see right you. here. Oh, I got you. In the back. Okay. Um, my question concerns other countries' monetary policies. Um, I'm just curious to know your thoughts on this. I mean, more, you know, some countries don't have your foresight and pursue a different kind of monetary policy, one that uh, devalues their currency over a significant period of time, which provides an advantage to some of their exporting industries. Uh, there are, there's a growing number of people, including uh, U.S. congressmen, some trade associations, especially side of the border, to say, Trade agreements, the new generation of trade agreements like TPP, for example, should include measures that prohibit or govern these types of uh, practices. I'm just curious to know, like, do you believe that trade agreements are the proper way to address this issue of persistent currency, monetary policy imbalances, or do you think that central banks actually have a role to play internationally to try to better coordinate monetary policies and exchange rates? Well, the, the full answer to that is yes, okay? So, uh, we, of course, central banks uh, bear the, most of that responsibility. Uh, and uh, in the, the central banking world where I live, it's, it's just uh, we, we all believe in a flexible currency. And if, if you're operating against your domestic objectives, such as an inflation target, the currency moves, and it's just one of the variables that moves. Lots of variables move, and it just happens to be one. So uh, if the U.S., for example, had the biggest crisis of all, and they cut interest rates to zero and did quantitative easing, uh, it would be all, any model of the economy I could write down would have the currency of a country like that go down during that transition. That's what happened. And so uh, that's exactly what you would expect, and it certainly wouldn't count as currency manipulation in any way. Uh, similarly, on the other side, if you tightened policy because the economy was too hot, the exchange rate might go up, and that, of course, no one would ever accuse you of manipulating your currency up. Okay, you only get accused if it goes down. And yet the two stories may be identical. So I do think that central banking is the right world in which to address this, but to the extent that it is governments who are maybe doing things which are a little bit off of that chart, then I suppose some form of international agreement, whether it's a trade agreement or some other thing, might be uh, a useful extra thing to have. But that's a, a theoretical answer. I, I have heard stuff about that around TPP, but I don't have a direct comment about it. Thanks. Yes. So I'd like, I'm getting the hook now. So <laughs> unless there's any more questions, I think not. So we'll stop there. Thank you very much for your questions. Merci.
Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Paulos. Uh, good of you to remind us of the economic risks that we're, we're tackling in Canada and how the bank is helping to manage those. I'd like to now ask uh, Norm Steinberg to uh, thank our... Uh,